Okay, welcome back. So let's go. Um, we are talking today about AI and jobs. Um, here you find some sources, um, but you know, you as always, you don't need to really read the uh, original sources because I have copied most of the stuff that's interesting into the lecture notes. So if you just read these lecture notes, they contain everything you need. Um, so here is um, just a, a little bit um, of an overview about the different aspects of this whole problem. Um, you have, you know, in the center quantitative estimates uh, of impact of AI on work, so how many jobs will be lost and so on. Uh, you have, um, you can do some economic modeling of the AI impact. Uh, you have ethical considerations on the use of AI. Uh, forecasts of future skill demand, analysis of economic and social impact of, of ICT on work, um, papers on computer science on improving AI system. This gives you an this gives you an idea of how um, how many papers are published in computer science, and from this and, and in what areas they are published, and from this you can try to judge um, how the field will develop in the future. Um, Analysis of earlier technological change, industrial revolutions, right? This is a historical perspective which can also help us understand what's happening. Um, and so you have all kinds of business and psychology studies on human machine interaction and also psychology um, uh, on, on work as a source of meaning. This is important when we talk about um, unemployment and the universal basic income we will see later. Okay, So all these are things that you have to consider when you talk about AI and jobs. So this is a very complex topic. And here in this one session, we cannot really uh, do it justice. So we will um, have a very brief overview of that. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than what we can talk about here. Okay, So this is what um, I just told you. So we have different applications of AI in specific sectors or occupations. Um, we, When you think about robots replacing workers, you, you first probably think about robots uh, in factories, uh, replacing workers in factories. But this is actually not necessarily uh, the most common uh, use. So factory workers will certainly also be replaced but the job loss will not end there. As opposed to previous industrial revolutions that primarily replaced human physical work, um, AI creates machines that can perform very complex tasks better than humans. And we will see examples below. Uh, automation, of course, is not a new thing. Lots of jobs, uh, they have existed um, forever, right? Since the Industrial Revolution, this is the most common and most recent example, human workers have been replaced by automated machines, cloth making, weaving in the 19th century, uh, car production in the early 20th century, sales and manual fare collection in buses, right? Bus conductors replaced by octopus carts. When I was young in Greece, there were still bus conductors, people going around and collecting the tickets on the bus. Um, shops replaced by vending machines, uh, automation at McDonald's, you know, this kind of thing. Street shops replaced by online shopping. So you see all these are examples of people losing their jobs due to automation. So it's not necessarily a new thing. It's something we, we know well and we are used to. Um, lift boys, right? If you see sometimes old movies from the 40s or, or earlier, um, you enter an elevator and there's a lift boy there to, to move the elevator up and down, right? Uh, nowadays we don't have lift boys except for perhaps some particularly um, luxurious places where this is just um, a funny thing to look at. But of course elevators move by themselves and they don't need anybody to uh, control them. Um, typists, secretaries, accountants, human computers, you know, funnily the word computer uh, originally uh, meant a human. It meant a human who was trained to calculate uh, big accounting tables. Um, and this computer was a job, right? And then uh, these were replaced by machines also. Uh, and now we see the same with typists, secretaries. Um, recently, very recently in the past, you know, 
10 years, 20 years, um, voice recognition has become good enough to be useful uh, in practice, in offices, and so where in old times uh, every doctor, for example, would have a secretary to type uh, down the diagnosis and the all kinds of, of papers and documentation. So now these are slowly moving away and uh, are being replaced uh, by voice recognition systems, uh, computerized systems that store all the files in electronic format somewhere. So uh, you have all these jobs getting lost. So it is not primarily, you know, talking about factory uh, floor automation. Um, and, but, but of course it is also, right? So Foxconn plant um, in China has already replaced 60,000 workers with robots. <clears throat> Here we have a cashierless ordering at McDonald's, another uh, thing where, you know, essentially every machine here replaces one person, right? Because um, you can only interact with one person at a time, you can interact with one machine at a time, so if there are, you know, so many machines needed, then this will be the equivalent number of people who are not employed anymore. Um, interestingly, uh, industrial robots don't really threaten jobs, um, uh, so there, there doesn't seem to be a relationship between a country's use of robots and the percentage of manufacturing jobs lost. Um, or only a very small one, right? Um, percent of change in the use of robots is at the bottom, you know, so the, the countries on the right use more robots than the countries on the left. And manufacturing employment um, um, is on the, on the vertical axis. Um, and you see that there is almost no correlation. There is a, a very uh, little the curve going up very little, right? The line there. Um, it's, but as I said, I mean, it's not the industrial robots are not primarily uh, what is causing the problem, um, especially, you know, in, in richer countries where um, the costs of employing people in factories is relatively high. Um, their automation of factory working jobs has been going on already for decades um, and there is not a big change now with the use of robots um, more more autonomous robots and uh, so this this is not the primary problem right it is all these other people who in the past uh, had what they perceived to be safe jobs uh, which now are slowly being threatened. So we have to distinguish, you know, automation and autonomous robots here. Automation is the use of intelligent but also dump machines in industrial production tasks, which has a long history going back to windmills, horse carts. Um, even in, in ancient Greece, you know, the use of, of um, machinery um, to make pottery, right? You have these rotating wheels to make pottery that make it much easier to make um, pottery. And all this is, is a form of automation, right? And um, this has been with us forever, some kinds of automation. Um, you could even say, um, you know, um, um, a bow and an arrow is a kind of automation, is a kind of machine that allows you to shoot more animals than if you had to uh, wrestle with every single one and, and try to kill it with your hands, right? So automation has caused loss of jobs throughout the centuries, but we got used to this, right? These were primarily low, low qualification jobs, um, but the new phenomenon now are autonomous learning robots, because all these other artifacts, they don't learn, but our robots now can learn. So uh, the job loss here affects not only blue collar workers and people who have repetitive tasks in work, but also specialists who um, are selling their um, expertise or their um, ability to specifically, you know, um, uh, think, uh, distinguish, classify, uh, and all these are functions that machines can increasingly uh, take over. 
So these are radiologists who read x-rays, dermatologists, ophthalmologists, insurance specialists, tax and investment consultants, many other professions like that. Um, what is new in this debate are the novel capabilities of robots. Previously, we were limited to automation of repetitive tasks, and now they excel at typically human tasks. So diagnosing diseases from x-ray images and blood samples, uh, predicting insurance risk with no bias, which is interesting, right? Humans are very bad at probabilities. So if we, if, if you want to, to judge a risk, you know, it's very likely. Uh, whatever risk, I mean, it doesn't need to be something insurance specific. Um, uh, the, the the probability of whatever event, uh, as soon as there is a s somehow more complex calculation involved in this probability, humans are very bad at uh, judging it. There are many probability fallacies um, that humans are prone to commit. And robots, of course, don't have any of these problems. Um, and um, we have, you know, robots playing chess better than humans, the game of Go, uh, advanced strategic thinking better than humans, poker. Um, uh, poker is interesting as a game because it uh, also involves an element of deception as opposed to chess and Go. So a good poker player must be able to deceive their opponents and to deal with incomplete knowledge and deception by other players. And again, there, there are poker playing uh, computers that are better than human players. So it shows that even these typically human tasks can be better done by machines. Um, replacing actors in movies, right? They're deep fake uh, technologies we talked about in the past in this class. And these cannot only be used for criminal purposes, they can also be used to uh, revive, for example, uh, dead actors. Or uh, this has been used in Star Wars, right, where uh, some of the actors um, died during the long, you know, uh, decades-long existence of, of this franchise. And then they had to, in the later movies, they had to reconstruct them from existing uh, footage, but also uh, sometimes uh, digitally. And this works. We can make, at least for, for short segments, I mean, probably you cannot make a full movie with this, but for short segments you can um, reconstruct people uh, from uh, pictures uh, and animate them. Driving cars and flying airplanes more successfully than human beings. Um, this is um, certainly true for, for cars and airplanes. Um, most, I think we talked about this last time, or, or perhaps it is, I think it is also in this presentation somewhere, um, that um, most uh, causes for, for accidents can be traced back to human driver error. Uh, the same with most accidents uh, with airplanes can be traced back to pilot error in some form. So uh, replacing pilots and replacing drivers, although it might look, you know, scary, you, you say, okay, but well, what can we do if there is an emergency, you know, and there is no pilot, what will happen to the airplane? But actually, if you look at the statistics, most um, accidents are really caused by the pilot. So if there is no pilot, it's actually a safer plane than with a pilot. Finally, machines can understand spoken language enables efficient efficient dictation to a machine, makes transcription jobs obsolete, like uh, typists, for example. Um, doctors, um, a Wyatt reported in 2017 already, it's, it's quite an old, four-year-old um, finding computer scientists and physicians at Stanford University recently teamed up to train a deep learning algorithm on 130,000 images of 2,000 skin diseases. The result, the subject of a paper out today in Nature, performed as well as 21 board-certified dermatologists in picking out deadly skin lesions. So you have 21 dermatologists, and they are no better um, collectively than one machine doing the same job. Right? And this is a highly, this is not a factory floor automation, right? This is a highly um, expert job. Um, these people have been trained 
for year for decades you know to do this job and still the machine is as good as they are um, of course as opposed to to human dermatologists the abilities of machines are likely to further improve computers will continue to get faster data storage will continue to get cheaper um, and in future of course we will need more um, AI also to do things that presently perhaps we cannot do, like predict global warming effects and weather models, uh, develop stronger data encryption methods. We need to use AI in the search for resources, oil or rare elements needed in electronics, uh, state surveillance, uh, processing large amounts of text, voice and video data. So look, I'm not saying that this is a good thing, right? Um, and I just noticed that, you know, I, I have these examples here, AI-based search for more oil or rare elements or state surveillance. Uh, I'm not advocating that we should be doing these things. Uh, these are obviously um, examples of, of um, uh, controversial, at least, you know, uh, technologies that one might argue produce more um, harm than good for human society. But... Um, this is what we are doing and this is how AI will be used and if, if we don't want it to be used like this we need to be doing something um, on a political level you know against these users of AI um, but presently uh, this is what AI can do and this is what it will be developed to do um, saving labor costs you know taxi and truck drivers can be automated warehouse workers can be automated factory workers can be automated um, more targeted advertisements and ai based marketing in general ai based manipulation of democratic processes um, reduction of costs in health and elder care all these are are things that require the development of better still better ai but this is um, the, these are big incentives also for future investments and for more development of AI. Um, and of course, we need faster computation, but we have this, right? Um, computations are getting faster all the time. Um, we need um, quantum computing eventually as the promise of uh, being particularly um, fast and particularly in relation to data encryption, able to create codes that cannot be broken, um, fast analysis of video and audio data for surveillance, um, new methods of surveillance, you know, gate recognition, seeing through walls, walls analysis of electromagnetic emissions of equipment uh, that can be used to see through um, walls again. Um, we need robots to be autonomous in the real world, self-driving cars, buses, trucks, uh, but also hospital robots, for example, right? You want the robots in a hospital to move freely between the patients uh, without producing more patients, right? So you want them to be uh, harmless and, and careful while they move around. And uh, then you have all these improvements in robot strength, vision, mechanical precision, which allows us then to create machines for robot surgery, uh, for example, which is already used in, in some some procedures, you know, can only be done by, by machines uh, optimally um, uh, for example surgery on the eye you know or these laser uh, operations on the eye um, cannot be done by by just you know with taking a kitchen knife and, and working around your eyes this needs a precise machine to work um, okay and then and then we have this better understanding of human emotions right uh, the ability to engage emotionally with humans um, is a big part of research in AI. You know, how do we, um, how can we make a machine? And we talked about this in the past, right, when we talked about emotional robots, uh, effective computing. Uh, the ability of the robot to engage emotionally with humans, uh, either to detect human emotions or to respond to them or to pretend that the machine has uh, emotion-like states. This can be useful for elder care, health care, emotional manipulation of voters, customers in advertising. So there are all kinds of, of good and bad, right? Um, you see users here that um, 
require these abilities of robots. Um, the research is, um, you see here, going uh, strong. Um, you have all papers published. Um, are the yellow ones at the bottom? Uh, they are rising. I mean, science generally is growing. But you see how much faster AI papers are growing, even more than general computer science papers, right? So you have computer science papers in the middle and AI papers on the top. Um, so these are uh, like nine times, almost nine times what they were um, in 2000. And um, automation, of course, is not all bad. So if we talk about jobs, sometimes the discussion is, is framed as, you know, like, uh, how do we avoid uh, the bad effects of automation? How do we avoid uh, the, the effects that are similar to the Industrial Revolution when all these uh, cloth workers lost their jobs? But there are great benefits uh, also to automation. Um, the quality of human car driving here, this is what I mentioned before, right? The causes of traffic accidents in 1979 is a very old study, um, but there's no reason to assume that the things are different today, right? Human errors and deficiencies are probably caused in 90 to 93 percent of the incidents examined. So almost all incidents, you can say, right? Um, uh, go come down to human error. Uh, a UK study from 1980, driver error, pedestrian error, or impairment is the main or contributing factor in 95% of the crashes examined. Um, UK study in the US study, sorry, in 2001, a driver behavioral error caused or contributed to 99% of the crashes investigated. So driver behavioral error or impairment means also, you know, things like drivers being drunk or being distracted or being in love or being in uh, angry. You know, you have all these emotions of drivers, right, that prevent them from um, being focused on the driving, uh, from being um, uh, concentrating and, and uh, emotionless and, and reacting in the best way. Uh, in every situation. And the machine obviously doesn't have this, right? So the, the absence of boredom, the absence of other emotions, the absence of, of being distracted, right, uh, makes a machine a better driver. 2008, um, uh, National Motor Vehicle Crash Causation Survey, human error is the critical reason for 93% of crashes. So you see that um, uh, in all these, right, there's little difference from 79 to 2008, um, essentially, most crashes are caused by drivers. Okay. Okay. Let's go here. Um, we want to talk about jobs lost in 2020, right? This this is estimated from 2017. It's a little hard to find um, a very recent data on this because obviously, you know, the, uh, the job market... Um, you, you can only wait until the year is over and then it has to be analyzed and, and then you don't always have the data immediately. So it's always when you look on the internet for such information, it's always a few years back. Um, so here we are, you see the jobs uh, being lost according to, you know, predictions 2017 would primarily um, affect legal secretaries and paralegals. This is what I said with the... Um, uh, databases to look up cases, you know, um, the internet uh, dictation, uh, which allows lawyers to uh, automate the writing of letters without having to uh, employ someone to do that. Uh, bookkeepers and certified accountants is the other thing up, up here on the right. Uh, this is a major area of, of job loss. Local government administrative workers. Uh, very often, again, computers can do this job. Uh, utility company engineers, so better reporting, um, better computers um, analyzing better, you know, the situation of whatever water supply or grid. And um, this can also uh, save engineers. Uh, so you have all retail assistants, you know, and, and shops, salespersons. This is like what we saw in McDonald's with this example photograph. So these are all jobs that, that uh, are easy to automate. And then we have um, the least likely to be automated um, 
for the moment are delivering taxi drivers because self-driving cars, especially in 2017, were not good enough, but, but even today they are not uh, able to drive completely autonomously, right, or, or not allowed to um, and not able to. Um, and then you have uh, interpreters and translators, um, even less because um, although, you know, there is something like Google Translate, uh, machines cannot really translate uh, reliably into safe, understandable um, language. So these are, for the moment, they are relatively safe. Then you see we have here plotted skills and, and unemployment. So you have mathematics, skills uh, on the right, and social skills um, on the vertical axis. And then you have combinations of jobs that require particular skills. And you see that um, growing is orange, uh, the demand, right? And um, purple is um, falling, and about the same is gray. And you can immediately see that there is a distribution, there's a line going through here, right? Uh, at the bottom, you have all the purple jobs at the top you have all the orange jobs so the orange ones are those where the demand grows and you see that we have things like vocational counselors and judges financial managers and analysts and physicians and computer scientists and even accountants so all these um, are still growing while those that uh, are falling are those that require fewer social skills, truck drivers, auto mechanics, accounting clerks, machinists, welders, machine operators, laborers. So uh, fewer social skills. So the, the, the biggest difference is in social skills, right, between um, uh, above the line and then below the line. Uh, the mathematics skills are not that strong a predictor, especially in, in those who will lose their jobs and in falling demand. Uh, with the rising demand, you can say they are also um, stronger, so you need to go more on the right side, you have more orange, while on the left side you tend to have more gray, um, which is about the same. So if you, you know, if you want a safe job nowadays, you should tend to go for jobs that require mathematics skills and at the same time social skills. Um, you have uh, different here. I, I, I must try to wait a moment. I will try to make this a little um, uh, bigger. Here you see it. Okay. Um, what this shows you is doctors um, and it's in, in principle the same thing you know on the right side you have creative and on the top you have interaction based and so the amount of interaction is up and down and the amount of creativity is right and left and you see again that those that are being automated uh, are those that are repetitive on the left side some things like uh, dermatology and we saw already dermatology uh, is done the, the, the diagnosis of skin diseases of skin cancers is done very well by machines ophthalmology pulmonology dentistry so these are all things that can be automated which are mostly repetitive um, while uh, and especially if they are not interaction based so radiology right down here ophthalmology while dentistry is, is relatively safe, perhaps because it's more interaction-based. Um, but the jobs that are really safe are the more creative jobs, and here we are on the right. Um, psychiatry, neurology, oncology, emergency medicine, pathology, forensic medicine. These are things where you need to um, very quickly, you know, um, uh, react in emergency medicine, for example, or in pathology, you have something difficult to diagnose, you need to uh, neurology also, you have some symptoms that are not specific, and you need a lot of analysis in order to understand what's happening. And so these are the, the cases where um, you cannot automate so easily, okay? Um, so interaction rich, teachers, psychologists, entertainers versus interaction poor jobs. 
this is one axis along which there's a distinction, and then creative and flexible versus repetitive. Uh, the LM pilot example is interesting, right? Um, are LM pilots um, likely to be automated or not? So one could argue that pilots are creative and that their job demands flexible reactions to unforeseeable events during flight. This is what you would think a pilot is doing. But on the other hand, for the overwhelming majority of flights, the events are the same and largely predictable. You have winds, you have turbulence, low visibility, mechanical failures of the plane. So. Would a pilot be easily replaceable by an AI system or not? Think about it for a second if you want to stop the video. What about the pilots? Um, and, you know, some jobs like the pilots can be automated, but with some loss of features. So an autopilot can steer the plane perfectly for the overwhelming majority of flights. In 2016, there were around 2.5 accidents of airplanes per million departures. So these are not, you know, percent or something. They are per, not even thousands. They are per million departures. Um, assuming that a pilot would have prevented those while an AI would have crashed. So this is a very extreme assumption. And assuming further that an AI system can fly the plane perfectly in the absence of an accident condition, this gives us an increase in accidents of 0.00025% if we replace pilots with AI systems, right? Very small. So these numbers are just an example estimation, of course. Uh, they are not meant to be a serious statement about flight safety, but to just give you an idea of the of the magnitude of things, right? Uh, so even if we are off by multiple orders of magnitude, it's unlikely that the risk from employing an autopilot will ever come close to even a hundredth of a percent. Consider also that around 50% of all crashes of planes are due to pilot error, and these would be automatically eliminated by the use of AI too. So it seems that you know just getting rid of all the pilots and replacing them by by AI should be good enough for you know every practical purpose, and it should be a huge improvement in flight safety. And um, and actually, this is what they are doing, right? Um, Boeing just now has a new plane in development that will have only one pilot. We are not there yet that, they, that the laws do not, allow, do not allow them to fly airplanes without pilots currently. But they have a plane in development that will have only one pilot. And in emergency, it will be possible to pilot it from the ground. Um, and you can see that this is going to be the future of this, right? So in, uh, when, when the laws then finally change in 10 years, 20 years, um, however long it takes the legislators to uh, get used to this idea, you will have planes being flown uh, completely autonomously or uh, with guidance from the ground. Uh, which is much safer, really, because if on the ground, you know, somebody has a problem or, or a medical emergency or the pilot dies, you know, you, you get another to control the plane from the ground, right? The, the ground is full of people that are available, um, and you don't need to, to stick them into the cockpit. It, it also gets rid of all the possibilities of um, um, kidnapping, you know, a plane, um, just um, hijacking a plane, right, you say. Um, if there is no pilot, you know, there is nobody you can you can threaten in order to hijack the plane. So this would also solve lots of security problems with airplanes. Um, so it seems that it would be okay to replace pilots with AI systems, even if we lose the pilots very rarely exercise the ability to react creatively to a flight emergency. Um, so the problem is we currently don't know enough. We're in the middle of this big historical process. And when you are in the middle of a historical process, it's very hard to see where it's going. So it's impossible to say whether the loss of jobs will lead to a lack of jobs and the resulting mass unemployment or a complete change of required skills, uh, which, which in this paper here they call scenario B. Um, and the result is likely to be some combination of the two, but which will it really be? We don't know, right? So social consequences um, of automation, social consequences now, not, not technical only, you know, in the amount of jobs, but um, also the, the social importance of that. Uh, you see that 
um, you have on the left side the jobs at risk of automation um, percent of total so going up the axis shows you that you have more jobs at risk from automation and the GDP uh, at the bottom and this line what does it tell what does it tell you it tells you that the GDP per person where it's lower you have the higher percentage of jobs that are at risk from automation <clears throat> so the poorer the country the more jobs get lost and this is exactly what we don't want right this is the this is the worst possible outcome that automation again is hitting those hardest who uh, have the least uh, privilege anyway right and those who are already rich and can afford it are hit the least this has various reasons I mean ob obvious reasons are that automation for example um, is is biggest in manual jobs uh, in agriculture very much um, the automated picking of, of produce in, in farms and fields and the automated processing of uh, products in agriculture and so this hits countries that are primarily agricultural and these are the countries with a low GDP per person right because uh, agriculture doesn't make a country rich um, while the countries that are very um, wealthy often um, have jobs in the service sector they're, they're developing technology they're doing all these advanced things that are more difficult to automate right so you see that this is a very clear thing here and and this is uh, this is a problem for global justice of course right it's a problem for um, the global distribution of wealth also and and in the end this is the kind of thing that causes migration um, all these unemployed fruit pickers you know from places like Turkey or uh, Greece or uh, I don't know um, uh, whatever um, countries this this is very much centered on Europe as you see right there are very few data points from other places um, but all, all these people who are unemployed I mean they have to go somewhere to find a job right and this is what's then one of the one of the causes that drive migration that uh, uh, these people cannot survive in their native country, so they have to go somewhere else. Um, and at the same time, you know, if somebody who is not qualified to work in these other very high qualification jobs uh, ends up in one of these countries on the right side, um, they find it difficult to integrate there because they are lacking the language skills, they are lacking the... Um, computer skills uh, that are needed in order to find a job there that is appropriate to that uh, country's distribution of jobs right so uh, this causes all sorts of problems um, it can cause wars it can cause uh, conflicts armed conflicts because um, the less people are able to work in these countries the more they have to try to survive by using you know natural resources that they can um, monetize like oil um, and then this drives conflicts for example like the one between Turkey and Greece over uh, oil in the Mediterranean um, there is oil in the Mediterranean as long as you know countries like Turkey and Greece are happily you know um, wealthy enough uh, with low unemployment uh, they don't need to exploit these resources they can leave them alone and, and they can happily you know coexist but when things get uh, bad because you have all this economic impact of automation and suddenly you have all the unemployed people in Turkey and Greece then of course the country needs to get an income from somewhere so it will concentrate on exploiting these resources and then these resources become contested and then um, in the extreme case you have an armed conflict between these countries over these resources right so um, this uh, th there are some other this this I, f I find these very beautiful I must say here these little diagrams uh, but they are extremely hard to um, make sense of um, 
perhaps this one we can have one look at that so this is on the right side they, they are beautiful but they're really a bad kind of diagram if you want to understand what it's saying L low page and uh, right is most likely to be automated and less is least likely to be automated and um, up is best paid and down is um, worst paid and now you can see just looking at them at the whole um, idea here you know at the distribution of colors you can see that um, that the bigger circles right are more people and so now you can see that we have on the right side low paid right bottom because it's low payment right and these are um, the most vulnerable you know from uh, job automation uh, and these these are waiters and cashiers and you know retail sales all kinds of things and the least vulnerable and best paid are uh, on the left side on top these are physicians surgeons dentists we we already talked about the doctors a little right so it's not it's not always clear there there are different kinds of doctors right they're different um differently uh, vulnerable to automation um but also teachers you know on the left side so but you can clearly see that um the colors in code, right, the degree that people have. So red is no formal education and bluish is bachelor, master, uh, all kinds of, of uh, university degrees. And you can see that the most likely, uh, the most likely to be automated are the red uh, people who are here uh, on the right side while on the left side the least likely to be automated tend or to be bluish right so this is one thing you can clearly see here so um we talked about this thing already right so wh why is why is that the poor countries have more jobs in risk of automation than the richer countries because the jobs in poorer countries offer manual manufacturing work or farmer jobs which can easily be automated automated <coughs> the jobs in richer, uh, richer countries are often service jobs high on the interaction scale or creative development jobs high on the creativity scale and therefore difficult to automate um one thing you have to also consider is that um, there's partial automation of jobs. It's it's not uh, only important to say whether a job can be completely automated because this is often that this discussion is often um, you know presented wrongly. You say, okay, this this job cannot be automated or this job can be completely automated, but that's not the only important thing, right? Uh, job automation is not an all or nothing game. Uh, for example, robot assisted minimally invasive surgery does not replace doctors. Of course, you still need doctors, but it leads to faster turnaround times, earlier discharge of patients from hospitals, higher hospital capacity without the need to employ more doctors or nurses. And here you have then the unemployment, right? So in the end, it does lead to less employment of medical staff, including specialists. Uh, because the same amount of doctors then can perform more operations and, and the, the patients go away earlier and so they need less uh, treatment. And this is the problem, right? So if we can do the work of six doctors with only four, then two doctors will never be employed. This is not immediately visible as an employment uh, problem, but it is one, right? It's not like we are firing doctors. There, there were always four doctors, let's say, in this area, in this hospital, and the four doctors are still there so it seems like there is no um no uh, influence of automation on the employment there's just a beneficial machine coming in but we forget that you know uh, we would have needed another two perhaps in the long run which now will never be employed <clears throat> so greater efficiency is equal to partial unemployment right um, the ethical, political, regulatory issues, we already talked about the worldwide um, the balance here. Uh, the colors are just uh, geographical, so this is a bad kind of diagram where the colors mean nothing, but um, because we already have the information on the map, right? But you see that um, 
the automation is biggest um, in some countries in Asia, South Korea, Singapore, Sing Singapore is is very uh, Japan, Germany is very big in automation, Sweden, uh, while other countries uh, are not so much automated. Um, interestingly, the United States is not as much as you would perhaps think. Uh, and here we talk about industrial robots, right? So the, um, of course, you you also perhaps have to consider uh, what kinds of industries these are, right? So this alone doesn't give you much information. <clears throat> you have to consider the different kinds of industries. Some are easier to automate, some are more difficult to automate. So if you have a factory um, making some easy plastic part, you know, as part of a car or something, uh, then this can be fully automated easily, right? While if you have something um, like the production of, let's say, um, art um, or or household products that have some uh, kind of artisan aspect to them, uh, then even if they are made in factories, uh, you need perhaps more quality control, you need more humans to watch the process. Uh, and so you will have... Um, less ability to completely automate the process, right? <clears throat> so um, you need to, to, like I said, right? You need to, the kind of manufacturing, um, some kinds of manufacturing, cars, electronics are done at a big scale, more suitable for the use of robots. Uh, for other kinds of manufacturing, like crafts, more specialized artifacts, they might not exist, suitable factory robots, or the factories might be too small, right, to make the development of robots in such factories economically viable. So if you have a product that goes out only in small numbers, um, relatively small numbers, then de even developing a robot that can do that will probably not uh, be done because it's not uh, expected that such a robot will sell enough numbers to make the development worthwhile, right? <clears throat> So when you see such a diagram, don't assume that it says something only about robot use or industrialization levels. It equally says something about the kinds of products a country manufactures, how centralized the manufacturer central sector is, and, and many other things. So uh, here we have some more statistics. I mean, I don't want to make this only a um, talk about numbers. So you have a look here uh, at these numbers later. Uh, you have the lecture notes, right? Look at them. Um, <coughs> one one thing is, uh, you know, the balance between rich and poor you have to consider, especially in Hong Kong where we are, you know, the gap between rich and poor is very big. These developments make things even worse for those who are not qualified for more demanding or creative jobs. According to Oxfam Hong Kong report 2015, about 9% of Hong Kong's population live in working poor families. The number of working poor households in the city reached um, this number last year. They are representing 10.6% increase compared to five years ago, 9% uh, of Hong Kong's population, right? Uh, Hong Kong's richest 1% owns 52% of the city's total wealth. So 1% of people owns over half the city's total wealth, whereas the wealthiest 10% take up 77%, almost almost 80% of the total wealth of in t by, owned by 10% of people, right? <clears throat> this is the highest among developed regions globally. And of course, um, automation benefits the rich more than the poor, right? The factory owners are those who will get the benefit of automation, of hiring fewer people, while the people who are out of work don't get much benefit from this, right? So, um, Tesla wants to create their own ride-sharing service uh, in 2016. They wanted, right? I don't know how the plans are now. Uh, so they have the profit from selling the car plus the continuous income from the use of the sold car, and the sales contract forbids the driver to offer their own commercial ride-sharing. So this shows you how um, automation is actually concentrating wealth uh, in the hands of those who already have it. Robots allow hospitals and elder care institutions to save money on human personnel. 
robots are very cheap in comparison to humans, right? So you have these robots in hospitals that that um, transport medicines or um, bed sheets around the place. You know, they're like big boxes where you stuff something inside and then um, delivery of food, uh, medicines to the patient bed. Uh, and, and these reduce costs by 50 to 80 percent. Um, and there is one hospital I found here in San Francisco, this uh, buy, buys 25 robots, each with 250,000 US dollars. So it seems like this is a very much a very big amount of money, right, to spend on a robot, a quarter of a million dollars. But you have to see that this medical center generates an annual income of 1.8 billion dollars, right? And so if you if you generate an annual income of 1.8 billion dollars, then paying um, a quarter of a million for one robot is almost nothing, right? And uh, it saves you 50 to 80 percent of, of personal costs. Uh, the robots cost practically nothing, right? In uh, the payback time for a new robot installation in China is around 1.5 years, and shrinking with time, it was two years in 2013. Uh, so perhaps now it's already less than that. Um, techno regulation is one um, aspect that's interesting about robots, but we don't want to talk much about it here because this thing is getting longer and longer, right? When you talk about how technologies affect life and economy, uh, it looks like we as societies are free to decide whether we want to use particular technologies or not. But the question is, is this true? Do societies freely and rationally decide to use or not to use particular technologies? And it seems that we can question this, right? Technology is also steered and regulated by scientists, by politicians, by the public, you know, uh, by commercial interests. Uh, can we as citizens of societies proactively regulate technology at all, right? And there are various theories. There's uh, one called technological determinism. Technology determines social development. This would say that technology develops by itself according to its own logic, and then it determines social development. Like the printing press, for example, before the printing press came around, there was no need for a printing press. It's not like society suddenly said, now let's go and make a printing press. The printing press appeared because one person wanted to make one, and then suddenly it took over. Uh, and completely change the world or the automobile, right? Um, the, another theory is that there is a linear relation of science to technology development. Um, you have basic science that always develops, you know, and then you have applied science and then development and commercialization of products. But this seems to be largely mythical. If you look at the details of it, we don't have time for that this time, but um, there are other classes where we discuss this. This seems to not be uh, really how science and technology work because many many technologies are developed uh, randomly they're developed by accident and not because they're the result of a basic science very often technologies are used without an understanding of the science behind them um, and an extreme form of this is to is called autonomous technology the thesis the technology is out of human or social control entirely and develops according to its own logic. For example, I can say I want a car, but the car then leads to, to me needing a street and this and, and fueling stations and accidents and hospitals and insurance companies and so on. And you can argue that uh, the moment I decided to make a car, I didn't really think about uh, streets. Perhaps I did think about streets, but not about fueling stations, not about all the 20th century uh, fight for oil, uh, the importance of Arabic states uh, rising, you know, on the worldwide um, um, the politics uh, arena because um, they happen to have the most accessible oil uh, in their countries. Um, the accident statistics, the hospitals, uh, development of hospitals, insurance companies, and so on. These are certainly not things that the people who had the first cars, you know, developed the first cars, were thinking about. 
But once you have bought into this technology and once you have started, you know, giving cars to the public, uh, you cannot take them back when you discover, oh, well, yeah, the cars need oil and now we don't have oil. And so we have to buy the oil from another country. And now this country suddenly has the ability to um, uh, determine our politics because uh, it can blackmail us with um, oil, right? Or, or even worse, you know. Uh, the destruction we cause because of we burn these fossil fuels and then we have global warming and so on. This is all directly a consequence of, um, among other things, the introduction of cars. Um, and so if we didn't have cars, of course, we would have other problems, but um, the world might be much different. And not only because the cars would be missing, the world would be much different because many, many other things would be much different, right? Social constructivism says that groups in society compete to influence and control technological designs. And then we have um, an interpretive flexibility in the beginning. This is an, an, another theory, right, where... Um, the design in the beginning is open and then slowly it stabilizes and gives us the designs that we know. <coughs> so in the beginning, a technological artifact has different meanings and interpretations for various groups. For example, you know, you can use a, a telephone in various ways to, to um, call emergency services or to use it on the way uh, when you are in a park to not get lost or to use the GPS function if it's a modern phone, right? Or you can use it to call your, your friends and um, arrange a dinner, or you can use it to keep in touch with your relations that live in another country. And and so these different groups have different interests, and they will um, uh, give an interpretation to this artifact for their own lives. Um, and a very famous example here is um, an example of uh, bicycle development, right, where this was studied um, Bicycle air tires, for example, were not accepted equally by all users. Some found them comfortable, others found them ugly, or thought that they slowed down the bike. Um, and so, um, in the end, these different social groups had to agree on the meaning of, of um, air in the tires, right? Um, then there is what is called the actor network uh, theory from Latour, whom we already know uh, from another presentation. Uh, he says technology can be described as complex networks involving material things, humans and concepts. Um, material, semiotic, semiotic means, you know, concepts, uh, relations. Um, so, for example, the interaction in a bank involve both people, their ideas and technologies, and together they form a single network, right? So a bank is not is not only hardware, a bank is not only software, a bank also involves um, concepts like money or wealth or uh, trust. Uh, without them, it wouldn't be a bank, right? And so this actor network theory tries to explain how these networks come together to act as a whole. For example, like I said, a bank is a network of people, things, and concepts, and it acts as a single entity. Uh, they are potentially transient, they dissolve and are remade again, um, and this means that the relations need to be repeatedly performed or the network will dissolve. So the bank clerks need to come to work every day, the computers need to keep on running. If the bank stops banking, um, then it is not a bank anymore, right? So it needs to be performing its function regularly. This whole is an area of research called STS, uh, Science and Technology Studies, or Science, Technology and Society Studies. And um, this is a very interesting uh, field of research um, that has to do a lot with what we are doing here. But it's a different thing, right? STS tried to explore how technology shapes, shapes society and how social factors affect technological development. If technological determinism was true, any attempts to regulate technology are futile. If social constructivism was true, then again, regulation by the state alone cannot sufficiently control technology. All groups in society must cooperate in order to shape the future development of technology. So now let's briefly look at our last uh, topic, the universal basic income. Um, when we say that hum robots take away human jobs and we have all these unemployed people, and what do we do with them now? 
then we can go this way arguing robots generate income also doing these jobs so if you if you are doing something where you earn let's say thousand dollars a month and you are replaced by a robot now the robot obviously generates an income that is somehow equivalent to these thousand dollars a month or, or more because you know the thousand dollars are just what you get and additionally there are all the other costs um, of your workplace uh, that the owner of this workplace um, is carrying and now robots generate the same income right they do the same job so somewhere there are thousand dollars that originally you used to take for your job and now that the robot is there the robot doesn't get the thousand dollars so where are the thousand dollars somewhere there are thousand dollars left over um, and we should claim them and this is the idea of the universal basic income um, robots don't need most of the income they produce as opposed to humans they don't eat they don't you know uh, go for holidays they don't have children um, so they will need some for for energy they will need some for repairs but it's a relatively small amount and most of that amount will then be uh, unused instead of giving it to the factory owner we should distribute it in society and this is the idea right so um, the free income could be given to the ex-employees who are unemployed because of that robot. So whenever a robot replaces you, you get the income that the robot produces. And to simplify the mechanics of this, we could pool all robot-generated value and distribute it equally among the population. And um, the UBI, Universal Basic Income, is defined by a few factors that it needs to have in order to count as Universal Basic Income. It needs to be unconditional. Um, so perhaps it can vary with age a little, but not with other conditions. So children obviously wouldn't get a full income. They would get some part that is required for the support of the child. Um, but otherwise, everybody would get the same. It has to be automatic. Um, so not something that I have to claim every time and where I have to justify it, but it has to be automatic. Non-withdrawable, it should be um, not... Um, for example, you get it only as long as you are unemployed and, and when you have m more um, earnings or when you have a job, then they cut it away. Then it's not called a universal basic income. So it has something to be something that you can claim and that is always yours. Uh, it's individual, um, not on the basis of a couple or household, and it's a right. So every legal resident receives it. These are the criteria for something to count as a universal basic income. And the benefits of this go beyond the AI and jobs discussion. It's not only good a universal basic income for uh, people who lose their jobs. It, it's good for society in general, one could argue. Um, with a UBI, employees could afford to wait for better jobs rather than be forced to take the first jobs that they can get. So if I'm unemployed and I have a universal basic income, I don't need to hurry, you know, to get a job so that I don't starve. <coughs> I can wait <coughs> until I find the right jobs. <coughs> this would increase job satisfaction, bringing higher income, making better use of employees' education and experience. For example, with philosophers like we are, I know many of my friends with whom I studied when I was young um, went on to do something else. They, they studied philosophy, they finished, they graduated, and then they became taxi drivers because they didn't get a philosophy job. So this is a terrible waste of resources, right? You first train someone five years uh, to be a philosopher. Obviously, these have to be clever people, um, um, st hard studying, you know, doing all their work, and then in the end, uh, they are unemployed. Um, and so society has lost a lot of money on these people. And, and when they become taxi drivers, uh, this is a waste, right? They, they could be taxi drivers immediately and produce more value as a taxi driver instead of first studying five years. Or uh, other people could be taxi drivers who don't have the ability to be good philosophers, while those who can be good philosophers should be good philosophers. And the other way around, right, of course. I mean, taxi driving also requires lots of skills that <clears throat> you need to have also experience so it's also for the taxi drivers not good if philosophers take away their jobs right um, so citizens um, could volunteer more is another advantage perhaps and take time off for creative activities or further education so you would have more um, 
charities be better stuffed you know if you had a universal basic income because people who like to volunteer could do it while nowadays you know people like to volunteer perhaps but they are unable to do so because they're busy in their own jobs uh, same with creative activities further education very often um, you have people who say I would like to you know be a painter or, or write a book but I don't have the time um, Citizens could afford to provide better care to elderly family members and children, reducing the need for costly and inefficient elder and child care schemes. Uh, and you have to remember that this is, is not going to destroy the economics of a society because we assume that uh, this can be financed from the income generated by these robots, right? So this is something that the society would then um, or should then be, be able to afford, right? Young couples would be encouraged to have more children. This is one big problem in modern societies, you know, that um, <clears throat> the richer the country, the fewer children it has. <clears throat> West Europe, United States, and so on, um, produce fewer children than they need. Children are very important. <clears throat> Not... Um, um, in themselves only, but they are important for also the population pyramid, right? You have to uh, have the population, the aging part of the population has to be less than the working part so that the workers can support all the retired people. If you have, um, you know, um, like it is today, a pyramid like that, or, or perhaps even an inverted one, then you have fewer people at the bottom working and many more people at the top um, who need to be fed by these fewer workers so this is a big problem right um, <coughs> and so we want to have more children um, and a younger uh, society in average uh, in order to be able to finance uh, elder care but this will only work if we have more children of course obviously now robots change the equation there also if we have uh, more robots then perhaps we don't need so many children uh, so this is a little difficult to calculate how they should uh, work out uh, and in the end you know the um, the whole thing about the universal basic income the advantage is that it also is much less bureaucratic than other welfare schemes uh, often when you want to get some some money back from taxes or something you have to do all kinds of of, of jumping through hoops in order to get money from the government you need to collect your little uh, receipts for everything uh, which is a total waste of time your own and the government's uh, and so if we said you know everybody just gets five hundred dollars a month and it, they don't need to do anything for it this would improve also uh, the whole management of this thing right so it would be easier to deal to make it easier to for a society to deal with the loss of jobs due to automation so this is a what is attractive about it but of course universal basic income also has problems so one is it could lead to inflation if everyone has the same amount of money we don't have a greater supply of goods then the prices must rise to balance the demand and supply uh, there wouldn't be an increased standard of living it would be better distributed you would have fewer poor people and rich people you would have more everybody you know on one line but it wouldn't be like everybody suddenly would be rich right if you don't have more production uh, a ubi might cause people to get lazy and do nothing instead of looking for a job in the long run of course that would harm a society's productivity um, this is disputed whether this would happen right some people say humans are naturally productive and they would like to do things and, and develop their skills um, it probably depends on on how people um, also how educated people are, how much they know how to do something with themselves. Um, it would certainly take some time, right? In the beginning, if, if you start paying people, uh, everybody would probably like to, to be unemployed for a year and, and just get money without doing anything and sit on the sofa. And it will take some time until people realize that sitting on the sofa is not fulfilling and, and they need to start doing something. Um, and then perhaps in the long run, this would... Um, uh, lead to more people, you know, actually taking up creative work or um, charity work. Uh, lacking work experience would make it more difficult for long-term unemployed people to find work again and would perpetuate unemployment. So this is a thing that 
today when you are unemployed you are forced you know economically forced if you want to survive to find some work and this gives you again some qualification for your next work if you are not forced to find work then perhaps you would more tend to be more long-term unemployed and then have less skills and make it more difficult again to find uh, unemployment to find employment later um, and then chronic unemployment might cause might cause psychological family and social problems um, you know if people um, cannot find work we just stay them to, to pay them to stay at home this is problematic right because work is not only a source of income but also a source of meaning for the working person uh, work provides identification with a group of, of co-workers or, or um, the, the business we, we're working in a regular daily activity to fill uh, one's time friendships and other human relationships at the workplace intellectual stimulation learning and practice and problem solving and these are all important components of human well-being and you see that that um, with the um, uh, covid pandemic we had uh, exactly these problems right people were uh, at home and they were missing work they, they still had to work but uh, just being at home and not being at the company uh, caused many people to become unhappy you know because they were missing this um, regular contact and the social um, interactions with other people at the workplace right so not everybody is, is happy just working from home um, so therefore, and, and with retired people also, right, you see that they often um, are not very happy uh, after the uh, first or second year in retirement when the novelty has worn off. Uh, they, they try to find other ways of keeping themselves, you know, employed and useful because they feel that uh, doing nothing is not really a good state to be. Uh, so it will not be easy to abolish work and pay people for doing nothing without causing these grave social problems. So this seems to be a problem with universal basic income. Um, there have been a few UBI experiments. Alaska uh, had a limited UBI since 92. Each resident receives $1,200 per year, but this is only a tenth of a full income. Finland had a short-lived UBI experiment in 2017. They gave 2,000 unemployed people 560 euro per month as a basic income, but one year later they stopped the program because um, it didn't seem to be sustainable or to produce any good results. Scotland is funding research into a program that pays every citizen for life, uh, 150 pounds a week, 100 pounds a week for working adults and children, 50 pounds a week um, in 2016 Switzerland voted against the universal basic income the government proposed paying every citizen 2,500 Swiss francs per month so um, presently these experiments are all you know halted uh, or not working or being researched um, but you see that many countries feel that there is the need to do something um, and although at present the situation doesn't look like anybody uh, wants to have a universal basic income, uh, AI may change us, uh, the, the conditions and, and force us to um, introduce universal basic incomes because the jobs will just be gone and then society has to find some way of dealing with it. Uh, one way also would be a robot tax uh, of to be paid by companies where the robots have replaced human employees but robot taxes also have few obvious difficulties right how do you calculate it for example if you calculate the tax proportionally to the number of replaced human workers you would need to know how many humans have actually been replaced by that ai technology this can be very hard to calculate especially for new businesses that have never employed humans or for work that would be impossible to be done by humans right like cleaning up the core of a nuclear reactor which which a human cannot do a robot can do it so perhaps now you you have a better safer nuclear power plant but how do you calculate the robot tax for that or how to calculate tax related to working hours when robots work 24 hours a day robots don't need rest so how do we calculate it do we um, calculate proportional to the hours worked um, does a robot that works 16 hours instead of eight replace two humans this will depend on the kind of work done and work that involves cooperation with other humans might not be as efficient when performed at night 
Alternatively, we could tax the total generated value of a company over the course of a year independently of the number of workers replaced. This was simplified calculations, but then be unfair to enterprises that generate a big amount of value with relatively few employees, right? There are such companies like small startups that have one product that explodes um, and they're not manufacturing themselves, they're just, you know, designing or programming something. Then you have companies that have very few employees but create a big amount of value. Um, such taxes have been proposed. There is in Austria the Maschinensteuer, Maschinensteuer of 2016, and in Italy the Regional Tax on Productive Activities, 1997. Um, but there doesn't seem to be an ideal solution to the problem, and multiple approaches are being considered, and you can read more about them um, on the Internet, right? The problem, generally the problem doesn't go away. Uh, the effect of AI on jobs uh, and some solution will have to be found, only we don't know yet how, what it will look like. Okay, that's it. Um, this was pretty long, sorry about that, uh, but it is a long and difficult topic, so um, it's perhaps in future we should split it into two sessions or something. But anyway, here we are. Class discussion, questions and exercises. Go back to the um, lecture notes to, to find... Um, the exercises and and for the moment so thank you for uh, listening to this and see you next time thank you and bye bye